Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Allison Wickens, Vice President for Education at George Washington's Mount Vernon, but also here representing Teacher Insights and very excited um, to kick off this meeting here um, we, uh, for this session with Sabrina and Michael. Um, and Mike is also former Teacher Insights leader, now Teacher Insights member. Active as many active as you as many as you are, um, and we're here to um, be let's see philosophical and independent. Are those two key words we can pull out? Absolutely. Um, well, for those of you online, um, there is a um, a whiteboard activity that people have been contributing to as they walk in, um, which invites uh, you to write definitions of the words collaboration community and accessibility. So if you want to scribble that down on your notepad, maybe we'll be getting to those later on. <laughs> All right, so thank you. Go ahead, get started. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Um, so we are back to back in the session that starts at three o'clock and we are going to do our best to get through everything in an hour. There will be more participation than uh, just the whiteboard. So we'll get to that uh, later on in the session. But for right now, we just want to welcome you to resurfacing uh, stakeholders, historical voices, and access to primary sources with myself, uh, now the Director of Education at the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia, formerly Head of Education Programs at the American Philosophical Society, and with Sabrina. I'm so sorry to interrupt you all, but there's a note in the Zoom chat that says that there's a handful of us in room 2020 for the hard history session. We think we may be in the wrong place. Oh. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and I'm Sabrina Bocanagra, Assistant Head of Digitization and Digital Access at the American Philosophical Society. I just want to start out by just giving us a little bit of an overview of what we're going to uh, do today. Uh, I'm going to start by giving a brief, brief, brief presentation on uh, Rev City and what we're all about. Mike will uh, talk about the how and why, which is like, very obvious. I don't know. I'm excited to see what that is. Yeah. And then uh, we will actually hear from one of our stakeholders um, at 220 who couldn't be here today. So we have a, a video recording of him um, answering some questions. And then 230, hopefully on, we'll be our workshop portion. And hopefully we have some time for a QA and a as well. Yeah. And just so y'all know where we're going with things today, too, uh, we just want to make you feel more confident in advocating for internal and external collaborative projects, which make this work essential and to give you an exposure to the basics that enable or boost digital access. Okay. So let's start uh, with the APS. So uh, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 to promote useful knowledge. For us, the philosophical part of that name um, refers to natural history or what we consider science um, today. The APS still functions as a museum, library, and society, and our collections relate to the history of science and anthropology, Native American and indigenous history and language, and the history of early America and the American Revolution, which is why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so, creating the Revolutionary City. This project uh, has been in the works for several years now, and it started with the APS developing, or trying to develop this uh, digital online portal that would unite uh, manuscript material related to the revolution from 1774 to 1783 within Philadelphia. Uh, this started out with just our three institutions, the APS, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the uh, Library Company of Philadelphia to really tell the story of the American Revolution as it unfolded in Philadelphia. Everyone knows 250th anniversary is coming up in 2026. So what better way to create this portal as a one-stop shop for users of all backgrounds to learn about the diverse uh, lives of people living through the revolution. One of the primary goals of this project though was to forefront the voices of those traditionally marginalized uh, from the historic record, women, African-Americans, indigenous people, loyalists, neutrals, children, the list goes on and on. Um, we wanted this uh, resource, or to create this resource that provided a more diverse and inclusive picture of the revolution. So over the past couple of years, I have mainly focused on mass digitization. So just scanning of documents from all three of our institutions, and then enhancing the metadata or the information associated with those documents in order to make it more discoverable in the portal. In our pilot year, which is the IMLS National Leadership Grant part of um, this slide, we were able to determine what worked for us and what worked for other projects, or sorry, what worked for other projects and how we could adapt that to um, 
to our uh, workflows and documentation. You know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. That's not the point of this collaborative effort that we're trying to do. Uh, we also uh, reviewed descriptive metadata practices among our partners, again, as larger institutions with different resources um, for cataloging and then our just technical infrastructure. We found that there were obvious differences in formatting and um, that type of thing, our digital repositories, but then the similarities were there in the core information about just specific items. Um, things that people were documenting, so the titles, the creators, and the dates of these, these items. Something new that we did, though, in our uh, pilot year was that we engaged a group of stakeholders. Um, these 16 stakeholders were our team for one year, and they consisted of educators, public historians, digital humanists, uh, community members, and the like, um, who had this proven track of connection to diverse audiences. So over the course of a year, they were asked to advise on selection of uh, diverse materials related to Philadelphia and the revolution, how metadata might be meaningfully enhanced, and then the design of the portal itself that would hold all of these collections and which would eventually highlight these stories that we see here um, of these marginalized Philadelphians and be accessible to a broad audience. So engaging this diverse uh, team of stakeholders and incorporating their feedback at every step of the way, and I mean every step from out of the box uh, platform to what we have now. Um, and it was really essential, especially in the work of recovering or at least trying to figure out what these hidden voices would look like and then understanding the needs of all types of users. Uh, throughout this process, we realized, Mike and I and our team, that we were not only trying to highlight the voices of the underrepresented um, or marginalized communities in the revolution, but also the voices of our audience. Um, the stakeholder group had a say in every single aspect of the creation of the like I said earlier. And it was really special and um, eye-opening to us as the technical team or the education team when building out this portal. Uh, as a tech kind of part of this uh, uh, team, I, we like to think that we create these digital projects for our audience um, and we have what they want in mind, but do we rarely uh, engage or ask them what they really want until the end of the project or, or we think it's complete? So a year of asking questions and having discussions and explaining all these processes, uh, technical or not, was helpful for all involved, especially when it came to building an actual functional, useful website. Um, and I just wanted to share what I said about out of the box, this is what the digital uh, Rev City looked like right from the start. And we uh, <laughs> we showed our stakeholders, and they're like, "So, are we going to get a user login?" I was like, "No, no, no, don't don't mind that. Let's, let's not mind this." Um, and then so we started with this out of the box product, and then all the feedback and continued um, over and over again. Uh, we got to something that, as an entire team, we would be proud of. I think that's where this collaborative project really um, benefited, benefited from. So this is what it looks like now. We will get to actually visiting the website later um, in the workshop portion. Thank you. Uh, so it's really covered a lot of the what, and truly when I say the what, I do not mean to diminish any sense of this. Metadata building a website is the hardcore serious work of this, and do not for a second think that asking people questions about these things is easy peasy and that you can incorporate it all. It's hard work, it takes a lot of time, and let alone the patience to do metadata work is truly really beyond uh, my skill set as a computer. So, great. Yeah, so, great. so part of what we wanted to do is uh, have you all define collaboration, community, and accessibility, because throughout this process, we learned that there are many different definitions of these three key essential terms in doing this work. And if you, your partner organizations, your stakeholders, your end users all have different definitions of this, chaos reigns. Try to get on the same page as everybody and build these definitions in. If you are the lead organization, you can come to the table with these definitions and then workshop them, but you have to have the opportunity to discuss what these three things mean or else you'll be in a massive headache throughout the whole process. So even today, uh, we have collaboration as an illustration, uh, which is kind of beautiful. It has a nice starting point, moves through time, and then ends and continues on. I believe that's my interpretation of it, but could be more to that story, I think. Um, but it's also working together equally, coming together to achieve more, everyone designing and building a sandbox. And if you think about that, right, um, there's collaboration in terms of what the work is being done, who's coming together to achieve more, and everyone designing. 
collaboration is also a multi uh, hyphenate thing in many senses. Are you doing collaboration amongst each other as a staff? Are you collaborating with your partner organizations? Are you collaborating with your stakeholders? What's the definition for each one of those? And really think about that in a core sense, because then you'll be able to define the metrics of success for what that means. Sometimes it's not collaboration, even though you love that word. Sometimes it is just co-working, and that's okay. When you have multiple organizations with all these archives, somebody needs to step up to the plate and lead something, and you are the one that can provide that definition of co-work or collaboration. For community, this often nebulous term uh, that we do like throwing around needs to have a definition. I think most of us in this room know that community needs to be defined. It can't just be, we're serving the community. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like the community in Philadelphia is vastly different than the community in Virginia. Thinking about these differences in defining community is a massively important thing. Let alone, do you want community built among your staff, among the partner organizations, among your stakeholders, and then your end users? Define each part of the process, define as you move forward, because again, you will know your metrics of success. Accessibility, I throw on there because this was one of the, the fun eye openers for me, where um, in conversations with Sabrina and some of the archivists and the digital humanists on the project, they define accessibility as just putting it on the website. Then it's accessible. And to a degree, right, that is access. From education, I define accessibility in cognitive, emotional, physical kind of terms instead of just putting it on the website and providing access. Both are valid in many different ways, but if you start having these conversations and we're talking over each other about accessibility, define, 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 and share all these things because every single step of the way can be a point of confusion or tension, if not even. Another part of the why is really thinking about uh, why a project like this or an approach like this matters. There's the part of the why that is for the organization leading the effort. You're in Leslie's session, you have a lot of these kind of uh, cynical or, or these selfish aims in a lot of different ways, right? So thinking about what that why is as an organization or your why in this approach will help you find the stakeholders, talk to internal people, get the buy-in from higher ups about these types of projects. For you in this room, I won't even broach that topic. Each one of you will have a different why, and that is important to acknowledge. You need to know what that is before you do types of collaborative work like this and pull in stakeholders. Because if you can't tell every single person your why, it's redundant, but why are they there? Um, and really thinking about that. For the stakeholders, this will also vary by audience, but finding that out through um, processes that you build in along the way. Uh, we had them write reflective essays, and a lot of them were really helpful for us in finding out what those why, whys were after the fact. I don't think we really asked why they wanted to be involved uh, from the get-go. We just saw people out that we knew would work with us on this project. Um, but one of the, the folks replied, moreover, as an archivist who's periodically involved in building project websites, I learned a lot about the needs and preferences of a wide audience of people. And they go on to describe why this project matters. Um, find opportunities, find the why, if it's a simple reflective essay, that's great. It's something they do as part of an application, even better. But really find that opportunity and build that into your process. And then for the audiences, you find out along the way that each audience also has a separate why, but make sure you find out that why. Uh, it's massively important. Then of the course, the, the why should we all be doing this, the royal we, um, it's massively important. And I won't delay or kind of hammer this point in because I think it's a beautiful quote from another stakeholder. What I want is not what everyone wants. I think that's good enough of a summary for why we should all be doing this and really seeing why this matters. Uh, cool. uh, another really eye-opening moment in terms of why this project matters, we were talking about this letter in one of the stakeholder meetings by um, Julia Rush, who's the wife of Dr. Benjamin Rush in Philadelphia. Ben, Dr. Benjamin Rush was out uh, doing important work and traveling around. Julia was stuck at home with children. She had a political sphere that was powerful in her own right. She would often write other women gain perspective or input and feedback on things. Um, so we started with that letter and we had the stakeholders draft up the metadata for that letter alone. One letter uh, to another woman from one woman who are all talking about childcare politics. Um, what it's like being the, the wife of somebody who's traveling around doing this essential work. Uh, so if you think about it, right, you can start with a search term like people, you can enhance it to women. And then just based on that information alone, what are other search terms or metadata that you can pull from that brief description of that letter of Julia Rush's? Children. Children. Mother. Mother. Friendship. Political right. observer. What was that? Political observer. Okay, great. So right there is four. And if you don't take the time to have that conversation in the beginning of these processes, Imagine all of the metadata that could be lost. 
purely lost. So by having these sort of slow down moments with individual letters that were pretty representative of the questions that are being pulled into this portal, we can expand the metadata for that letter to be not only women, people as a theme, but children, mother, friendship, what looks are good. Now think about how much more easily people can find that term. If you're teaching a political science class, you can find this letter. If you're teaching women's history, you can find this letter. You can talk about childhood, mother, motherhood, friendship. It's much easier to find these things if you take the time to enhance the metadata. All right, the, the how is another annoying one because this will vary drastically by organization. <laughs> uh, but the main part here is if you as an organizational leader or manager, you think about what you need to be successful. This is again, very painful. I right know every step of the way. What do you need to pull something like this off? You need a grant. What do you need to get the grant? You get the grant. What do you need to make the grant successful? You, you, and now you're implementing the grant. What do you need to end the grant? What did you promise? What did you promise? <laughs> <laughs> Revisit that once. Um, you finished the grant. How do you continue the life cycle? What's the life cycle after that grant? If you take the time to pause as a staff, discuss those what's. Everybody knows what they have to do, how they have to do it, who they have to work with to do those processes. And it's a simple checklist, essentially, right? It's a bit more simple or simplistic than writing out objectives, clear and um, kind of cut. But if you do your once in the beginning, you're able to really figure these things out along the way. This is the painful part of, as soon as you end one phase, start looking at this once again. And then uh, you have to think about how you build a community for stakeholders and other collaborative organizations. And I separate those out because we need to think about them separately. The way that you build community for your partnering organizations is different than the way that you build community for your stakeholders. And you need to think about these things differently because odds are you'll have a different definition for what community means for those groups. So if you go back to these basics over and over again throughout this whole process and do that basic work in the beginning, you're able to create a longer life cycle for these things. And then how to reflect on these processes to improve. Um, what's the weird joke? How many educators does it take to screw in a light bulb? One, and then you need a whole team to reflect on it later. Uh, and really thinking about how you reflect on the process the entire time. Over time, you'll be reflecting. Because again, you have different what's, you have different checkpoints, you have different phases. How do you reflect on each? How do you make sure you have your checkpoints at each moment in time? For our stakeholders, the reflection looks different and it might be really foreign to them. Getting some of the scholars to write a one-page reflective essay is not possible. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, we were happy to read two-page reflective essays by them, but it was wild to see that they thought they had to write more. And that's a good thing. You get more of that data from them, you get more of that information from them. But think about how you introduce the idea of reflection to um, all of your audiences and all of your stakeholders, because it can be interpreted pretty good. Remember our audiences, um, at some point in time, you have to do the scary, horrific work of introducing the portal or the project to the end users. You can be great, you can do it, just rip the bandaid off, it happens. Today, we're even introducing, like a, what did you say, a beta, 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 beta version yeah. of the portal still, I said that and it's still a work in progress. <laughs> um, so even thinking about that, it's important because you get the, the dose of reality that you need in these projects. There were any number of hyper lofty outcomes for this. And then we introduced it to teachers during an NCSS or National Council for Social Studies workshop. And the feedback covered over this one that I'll just call out. Um, it was the combination of document-based and inquiry-driven learning along with place-based learning was fantastic. If you if we wrote that down as the main objective for the whole entire thing, I think we would have been laughed at by like some of the other staff. But seeing that that's what teachers went in on. Um, in Wesley's session, I'm gonna keep referencing this. Uh, there was one group who said like being small and thinking small is not a bad thing. Being able to hone in on these aspects of teaching through primary sources is more than acceptable. But it might not be the high lofty objective they set out for. And you need these moments of checking in with audiences and end users outside of the stakeholder group at multiple checkpoints to make sure that your um, dose of reality is healthy and off. Now, we'll hear from an actual stakeholder. Um, I believe Kevin does his own introduction, so let me see if that is true. I think it's true. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Casey. I am a teacher of United States history at Pittman High School in Pittman, New Jersey, a suburb of Philadelphia. I'm in my 26th year of teaching. I had the opportunity to be a uh, stakeholder uh, on the Rev City Stakeholder Committee in 2020 and 2021. And I had a chance to work with the group uh, in the summer of 2022 as a digital humanities fellow as well. So happy to be here with you guys today. 
Great. We're happy to see you um, on video. You were not able to um, be with us in person, but welcome. Um, so just going to ask a few questions about your overall experience being a stakeholder. And we'll start with the first one. Um, as an engaged teacher, describe your overall experience with the APS, the American Philosophical yep. Society. Sure. So my my first experience was with uh, Mike in the education department, um, and I had a chance to bring my AP students over uh, to the APS um, for um, a workshop that was just uh, above and beyond what I thought it was going to be. Um, they did a great workshop with um, uh, having the kids look at what it's like to be a curator of a museum exhibit. Um, and they went through uh, the process of that uh, and just seeing real world applications of what it means to work in a history field. And then uh, my students had the opportunity to come over to the library and see just some amazing documents um, uh, that they were just blown away by. And, uh, you know, uh, that was the, the first opportunity that I had to be a part of the APS. And obviously that left me wanting to, to be a part of it even more so. Great, thank you. Um, so because of your relationship with the APS, um, for the pilot phase of the Rev City project, you were asked to be a stakeholder. Um, and this committee of stakeholders consisted of scholars, public historians, educators, community leaders, activists, um, archivists. Um, so as a stakeholder and an educator for um, high school students, did you perceive a difference between your perspective and the others in the group? Yeah, definitely. You know, what was cool about being a part of the group was that uh, a lot of times there's a level of intimidation, if you will, um, sometimes with uh, high school students or even uh, public school teachers or, or the high school level teacher. Um, you know, there's there's a perceived notion of the gatekeeper mentality with some of the databases and and libraries and things like that. So there's a little bit of an intimidation factor when you're not necessarily in the academic scholarly world in that in that uh, uh, respect. And uh, what I found with being part of this uh, stakeholder committee was that those walls were completely broken down. And, um, you know, it's just awesome to be part of a community that is so welcoming and open and um, ready to uh, allow this information to be presented to um, high school and middle school level students. So I think for me, that was the biggest perceived uh, notion that I got out of the stakeholder committee was this sense of community, the sense that we're all in this together and this information is available to anybody. So great. Uh, do you have any helpful strategies for advocating for teachers and your students um, in this type of setting? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I tried to uh, advocate for and push for is just making it as openly accessible to uh, the high school level student. Um, and so a lot of that is uh, breaking through uh, the, the barriers sometimes of some of that metadata mm -hmm. that uh, can sometimes be a little bit intimidating and in helping uh, students to find information. So as we went through this process, my, my role in this, I felt like was just, okay, how will this work for my students? How can we make this as easily accessible for my students? Um, so that's the that's the um, viewpoint from which I came uh, at this process, and and hopefully um, we were able to. We're connecting not just with the the um, figures and the uh, founding fathers that we're used to seeing, right? But we're we're telling stories of of these individuals that that are like us from this time period that you know might otherwise not have made it into the history books, and um, so I think it's really cool for for the students to see people that are like them and where they are in their lives and where they would have been during this time period. So that's really cool to see. Right. Um, so we're past uh, the year long, you know, um, conversation with the stakeholder committee. Um, and then we're in our second phase of the project. So you were awarded a fellowship at the APS's Center for Digital Scholarship. And as a fellow, you had this opportunity um, to become even more invested in the project and grow from this, you know, mutually beneficial relationship. So how has that impacted your thinking about the use of digital tools like this? Yeah. So again, I, I think I, I, I approached that uh, digital humanities fellow from the standpoint of what would it look like in a classroom setting? How can we make this? So one of the things that I tried to do is put together a little um, sort of e-learning introduction video that on the surface to maybe a, a, an academic or, or a scholar would, would be like, uh, you know, more uh, childish, if you will. But I think that's the sort of hook that a middle school age kid, that a high school age kid needs to get into this database to, to find it approachable, right? And so I put together that little um, e-learning component and then really just tried to pull um, the story of one individual. And I think it was James Hutchinson that I that I worked with and 
uh, finding that story. And then again, looking at it from the standpoint of, okay, I'm, I'm a high school student. Here's this, this information in this database. How can I now take some of this stuff and make it easily uh, approachable for a high school student? So a lot of transcription uh, needs to be done because, uh, and that's a big thing that the kids struggle with in primary source documentation. So that digital humanities fellow fellowship that I had really helped me um, further connect the database with uh, practical use in the classroom, which was awesome. That's great. Um, so you have this fellowship. Now you are talking with us uh, virtually um, as a consultant and uh, as a master teacher really of the project. So how much work, time, effort did it really take to move into this level of advocating for the project and you know reaching this level of mastery? I think um, the, when we're talking about the amount of work, when, when you're finding something that you love doing and you're passionate about doing, it doesn't always feel like work, right? So, so when you're really getting into this database, you know, it's like a treasure hunt. Once you find this one piece of information that is really fascinating, it sort of just spurs you on to the other. And now the, the job that I have as a teacher is to transfer that level of passion and treasure hunt sort of experience to my students and get them excited about it, right? Get them excited about seeing history in a real world setting. These aren't just words on a page. This is an actual document from somebody who lived through this, who went through this, right? And so um, it's making that that connection that I think is is what's most important as a teacher and, and uh, you know, sort of what I hope I'm able to do uh, through my experience with bringing this into the classroom. Right. So those are the benefits. Any takeaways from that as well? I mean, uh, there's always some level of uh, frustration from the student standpoint when they're working with primary source documents. Um, so they look at a document with 18th century writing and it's like there's a immediate glaze and they sort of shut down and cursive writing. Right. These kids have almost no concept now of what cursive writing. Is. So there's there's that um, you've got to sort of push him. And I found that's a that's a big takeaway is um, because once you do push them and they see practical use of the of, of the primary source and what they can get out of it, that that's when that aha moment happens. So the big takeaway for me from this with the students is just getting them comfortable with the actual primary source document itself. Got it. Um, just some final questions. Um, I didn't want to word it like this, but you know, was this overall experience worth it for you? Oh, as a stakeholder fellow, you know, our yeah. consultant that we come back to over and over again. Absolutely worth it. Right. And, and it's worth it from the standpoint of as a teacher, when you're in, in immersed in that environment with all of you over at the uh, APS and, and you're seeing these documents firsthand, it's like a uh, it's lighting a flame in me. It's lighting that that passion in me, that fuel in me uh, to get excited about this. And so when I'm passionate and fueled, right, again, it's going to transfer over to the students. So, um, you know, I'm constantly looking for ways to learn. I'm constantly looking for ways to better myself as a teacher because that's only going to aid my students. And so this experience was 100 percent worth it. Um, and the Digital Humanities Fellow was was one of the most valuable experiences that um, I've had as, as a professional educator. So um, I definitely thought it was worth it. Great. And any last thoughts about um, the stakeholder experience? Like you said uh, at the beginning, like you're part of this, this larger committee of stakeholders. Any pros or cons or anything you want to say to our audience who is sure. mostly at this conference, uh, museum educators, teachers like you? Um, yeah. Well, I think the, the only the, the biggest pro that I could could talk about is the fact that it was just awesome to see people from different walks of life within the history world coming together and, and having this mutual respect for each other and this admiration for each other and sharing of knowledge and ideas. Right. And um, so for me, it was valuable to see. Uh, you know, some of the scholarly academics, the museum historians and what they offer and bring to the table and seeing, you know what, I can probably bring some of that into my classroom as well. You know, this idea of curation of, of items and things and, you know, bring that in almost as, a, as an activity for the students in the classroom. So I think it was those multiple perspectives for me from people on different walks of life within the history field that was most valuable. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. Um um, and Kevin is truly the coolest teacher. Uh, no offense to anybody who has cool teachers in their network. Uh, he's like an announcer for University of Pennsylvania soccer team, the Union uh, soccer team affiliate. He's just cool. Uh, and he's been with the APS for so long. Uh, and we have plenty of time to talk about Kevin and his perspective once we get through the, the workshop portion of today.
Um, so as I hand these out, you'll notice there are four sections. Who is at the table? Gathering perceptions, resurfacing, and revisiting. In your tables, you go through the, through the first three, and we'll go through the fourth one a little bit later. Um, as you work through these, the who is at the table is really about introducing yourself to each other in the group, um, get to know each other a little bit, but then think about yourself as a user of this website, the University City, um, the University City, the uh, Revolutionary City uh, website itself. Define yourself as a, as a website user. Are you a researcher? Are you a teacher? Are you an educator? And think about those definitions, but also think about um, why you visited that website. Why are you going to the revolutionarycity.org? And then think about what you need for a positive website experience. <laughs> Gathering perceptions, same list of questions. Um, do your best to not visit the website until you get to the third portion of resurfacing. <laughs> but if you can get there beforehand, we're not checking. It'll be okay. <laughs> Uh, so go through those first three, and remember to just visit the website at the third heading. Oh, sorry. Five minutes on that, and then we'll uh, do some sharing out. And that's okay. Uh, some things we do want to highlight and talk about. Um, I noticed that a lot of y'all were really focusing in on who's at the table. It took a long time to go through that set. It should. It really, really should. If you want to get to know each other, and I'll get into this in a little bit, uh, but also thinking about who you are as a user of a website, it takes a while to develop these identities and learn about these identities. So that should take a good amount of time because you really don't know sometimes what you need out of a website, what type of user you are until you go through these processes or exercises. Um, and we spent a lot of time with the stakeholders asking them like, okay, no, no, don't talk about that. Talk about it from your perspective, your perspective. I get that there are uh, professors here, but no, you're not one of them. Talk from your perspective and really hammering in that like you are here as the expert in what you do. Focus and it will be okay. Um, so what were some of the user types that y'all came up with in your groups? Back here was mostly, you know, we're looking for primary resources. Mm -hmm. It's a research tool. Great. Yes. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for at most sites of this type, whether it's you know, this one or any other museum mm -hmm. uh, or organization of this type. It, it's a research tool. It gives you access to primary resources right. or research documents and you know, that's the number one thing we were generally looking at. And it's how that you would describe the, the revolutionary city to a similar user. That was a research tool. I mean, it, it has those things. It's, it, especially with the primary sources, mm -hmm. it has a lot of them. The images were phenomenal. You need to zoom in forever and still, you can read it. I mean, you can zoom way in and it's very, uh, very visible, you know, just no pixelation or anything. So that's really nice. Sometimes, even with museums that have high quality scanners available, you, you look at a document and when you try to zoom in enough to read it or look at the details of something, it'll start to get fuzzy on you. And it, it's hard to, to, to keep up with it. Yeah, it, it requires a lot of, a lot of uh, um, hardware to make that possible. So, yeah, it is. Well, Wild process. Uh, <laughs> but did y'all use your phones? Yes. Yes. And that, like, thinking about that working on the phone, uh, during that NCSS workshop or clinic, I had laptops on every single table. I had iPads on every single table, one of each on most of them. The teachers just immediately, I got phones. <laughs> I was like, okay, great. And then look for next time. Don't worry about laptops. Um, but that's an important mode of using this website. If you think about students, if you think about teachers, if you think about just general people trying to use things like this, getting that clarity and that layer of information across on a cell phone is also massively important. Um, but it took a long time for us to get to the point of people describing it the same way they think they're going to use it. And those should overlap. In theory, they should be overlapping. Um, was that a question or was a stretch? Yeah, as a teacher, I use a stretch. <laughs> um, as a teacher, I would think that it's Super duper easy to use. You just click on a site and you can find that information to find good primary resources, visuals, pop it in there or use it as a DVQ or uh, you know, a point of uh, inquiry. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah, like I said, it was just super duper easy to just find that kind of stuff. Um, I just couldn't find the information on um, visiting. Oh. Uh -huh. uh, interesting. I don't think we ever talked about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. It's part of the debate, 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 debate. debate. <laughs> yeah. We would, um, I'd use it in two ways. First, I'd be the researcher. And second, is there a way, to, I didn't get to that, is there a way to link to specific documents? to yes. share out that document because um, we're from North Carolina and we are looking at other people's repositories to see what they have about North Carolina. And I want to maybe put links on our page to jump to your page to say, here's some more information about North Carolina and on this site. And we have. Well, that's really interesting because like the first thing that comes to mind for me would be like a canned search just for North Carolina in the search and then you could send that like link that um that search yeah. return. But yeah. if there's more options, like or people are excited about that or just wanting to have like each state represented or each institution represented. Well, I got to 17 things that are in our North Carolina something. That's great. That's we'll see what we have. <laughs> so uh right, like that table of search worked. This table is having issues with search terms and searching and or results popping up. Um, but the other thing that this table is talking about is if, if you don't the, the um, so we joke that we're in beta, 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 which is dropping a couple of data from the description. Uh, but this is the fourth iteration of my card that we've gone through. Uh, for a while, it didn't have a QR code. For a while, it did have a QR code. The QR code is back. For a while, it said American Philosophical Society Library Museum with the logo on there. For a while, it didn't. Now it doesn't. Um, and a lot of that is just about using it and seeing what works for people, what doesn't work for people. Some of the partner organizations were like, well, where is our name and logo? So we have to drop the hours off of that to make it more succinct. Um, thinking about these things, they will all go through iteration. Every single part of it will have an iteration or life cycle in many ways. Um, Two quick questions. Yeah. Do, does the APS own Drinker's original diary? This was Drinker's diary. Henry Drinker? That is HSP, uh, the yeah. Society of Pennsylvania. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So you all aren't digitizing that. That's not on this site. So, um, because I, I put, I put Drinker in her husband's, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, her husband's account book or something popped up. You do have a Drinker account. Right. Book. Yeah, yeah okay. so that's the, the nice thing about, you know, these Philadelphia institutions, they all have the family connections yeah. and we're bringing them all so together. Would so would that be a link to it. her diary at the HBS then on this site? On the site, yes, not okay. directly associated right. with the APS, but on the Revolutionary City. And site. are you going to ditch to us everything that was at the David collection, the David Life? No, so that's an interesting question. I, I didn't really, it didn't come up with a scope, the narrow scope of the Revolutionary City. It's 1774 to 1783, oh, just okay. created in Philadelphia, All right. about Philadelphia, okay. sent okay. from Philadelphia. Okay. So that really, just with that, I, I've already scanned 40,000 oh, pages yeah. of material, yeah. um, and, like, and it's truly, still ongoing. Thinking about the scope, the number of times partner organizations came up to us like, can we be added? Mm -hmm. We have to say, no, uh, but luckily also really bad. What, what do you have that fits in the scope? Fine, yeah. fine, money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's not so far. Um, okay, so we just want to take you through that quick exercise, uh, exercise and give you a sense of what we put the stakeholders through. Um, a lot of this is pulled from the the workshops and the, the meetings that we have with the stakeholders. So we just wanted to give you that prototype or that template of, of sorts about questions that you can be asking your stakeholders about these things. Um, and a lot of it is, again, iterative or the same question repeated in different ways, because you'll need to do that throughout this process. Mm -hmm. uh, you really just need to focus on what those objectives are, what those what's are, what those whys are, and repeat them over and over and over. And, over. and I know you're running a long time, but did you do, how did you just look at, was there a worksheet? Ooh. Were they all talking? Yeah, um, the, so this was all on Zoom because it was 20, End of 2020. End of 2020. Oh. Um, so it was a bit easier to pull in um, a lot of people from across the U.S. to focus on this project. We have one teacher in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Boston. Boston, Boston yeah. Oh, Northeast, yeah. mostly, but a couple others. Um, and then depending on the, the exercise or the theme of the day, they either have to do homework leading into it. So some of this was find a website that you use and then come to the next workshop and tell us how you use that website, what you get on that website, what you don't like about that website. Um, and then some of it was uh, worksheets like this, the reflective essays. 
some of it too was like think about as many words as you possibly can based on this one primary source that you can use to describe it. And that's where a lot of the enhanced metadata comes from is them doing um, separate kind of group work on a single document. You might have had four documents in like one in group. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of just explaining what metadata was. I was, I think one person was in the um, the session that I gave before this, and that's all I talked about metadata because that is such a big thing for the portal, and people don't understand what it takes and the resources. So we, I had a whole like metadata one hundred and one session um, on for one of our meetings, and then we got into creating metadata, what that meant for them as just different types of users and. Just all of their 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 perspectives on the research value or or the access points and how to get to uh, this Julia Rush letter that my daughter earlier. So it's interesting. We heard from the teacher um, that transcriptions were really important for him as he was thinking about students being able to use the site. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it looks as if those that's not a feature right now. If again, missing them, is that something that you're thinking about? At? How do yeah. how do you when you hear that kind of mm -hmm. uh, panic and yeah. yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not about currently, but it's something yeah. that we're working towards. We do have a uh, transcription that is available that we've had interns, fellows, and volunteers um, have done on the material that is digitized. We have all of that right at the at the go. We're just waiting for. I guess I failed to mention that we're in migration. Uh, we're upgrading to a a newer um, software for our website. So how long has that taken? That has taken, we've been in migration since December of 2022. Mm -hmm. It's just, I think we'll be launching in a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> um, you'll see the more site, the site that you're seeing right now with all its uh, weird functionality and errors will hopefully be remediated uh, in a couple of weeks with our new site that will look very similar, but have um, some upgrades. Yeah. And uh, for the transcription too, something that Kevin and I landed on was um, if you clicked on it, there are no primary data source sets right now. Partially my fault for leaving, uh, <laughs> partially the fault of, of other time delays. Uh, but any of those that are chosen for classroom usage will have a transcription directly paired with those documents. Mm -hmm. So if it has an education with use attached to it, it will not appear on that website without a transcription. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good way of like, narrowing it down to so yeah. you know like, what teachers want and then you can actually focus on what's being used or what we're pushing out the rest. Right. And then currently we have our digital project specialist uh, at the EPS working on figuring out, uh, I mean, looking at different softwares that will be able to read 18th century handwriting and turn them into transcription. That is the next level of not even just crowdsourcing, which is on the horizon, but using AI basically to do a lot of that work because it would help with- um, Is there a contextual introduction to each discrete um, object or collection that you are digitizing? So not for the collection as a whole, um, which we are working on, but for each item, there should be at least a, oh, a, a little a description yeah, right. of yeah. what uh, it contains or the title will right. describe exactly what it is. That's, yeah. that's even better than yeah. Have you ever, sorry, what is the question? I see it's built in Drupal. Is it going to still migrate into Drupal or what's it going to? Yeah, no, it's uh, so Drupal is the um, uh, the, the, the front end. We're using Islandora. Um, so we are going from Islandora 7 to Islandora 8 right now, um, which uh, is interesting. <laughs> um, but everything uh, will be preserved in our uh, back end Fedora. Sorry, there you go. It's fine. That's great. Oh, yeah. technical. <laughs> Have you ever considered, and this would this would require more work, but developing as the first layer of the site? I am a teacher. I am a scholar. I am a. I don't know that we. Just because I I could yeah. see teachers looking at this and being like I. Yeah, yeah. Where do I go? Uh, they don't they don't have the time to do as much digging as yeah. they'll just be yeah. And that was, um, out to start with that. Yes. I, I think that's like where we landed on for a while. We were debating the login kind of thing about that. If you just have your login, you know exactly what you're looking for, you can save this stuff. Um, but then because of the unique links that books and things will generate, but I, I would never send a teacher the revolutionary city yeah. I would send the, the primary source itself or the, the data set that was being worked on the video that Kevin talked about. Yeah, right. um, so really utilizing those unique links instead of the, the website as the landing page itself. Mm -hmm. so, right. Or the landing page, just like the resources or education yeah. resources yeah. that everything would be under there. Right. Right. And sorry to use this, I know you're creating the, the sets. Mm -hmm. Is there also, are they tagged in such a way that someone can go in and sort by that? Like what's showing me all the notifications? That will be a feature. 
eventually. <laughs> yeah, I, this is all future. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, no, it's excellent. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. What we want out of the website or when land on that page. Did you have like going back and forth between like teachers and students and and if some of us in the room are archivists or museum workers who are more familiar with like kind of going through a database like this, have you have seen any like specific insights from teachers or students that aren't as familiar with that? And have like have they noted anything particularly in the room to you? No, maybe it was because Kevin, Kevin was so familiar with us and like hopped on the metadata mm -hmm. train. Um, which, by the way, if you're not in the metadata train, fully get on board. Um, it's one of the best tools ever used, but also on websites like this, it's the best thing to look at. Um, Kevin was developing lesson plans at the end of his uh, fellowship dedicated to metadata and how to use that uh, as a classroom organizing tool. Uh, so really thinking about that, like, right, because it happens anyway in terms of search terms, themes, and everything. So I was fascinated by that as being the unknown kind of piece of that puzzle. Uh, I have two more questions. Um, okay. So the new website or the new, are you guys contracting out or are you doing that internally? Um, so it is contracted out um, with a, uh, a service provider that uh, is upgrading or migrating our system, but everything that you've seen so far has been internal. Okay, and then the, your registration process would be on this website and or will you have a separate registration process? Oh, so we drop registration we, processes yeah. and open website. It'll be, yeah. yeah, open access. Yeah. Okay. That's why it was funny to just see the out of the box, like, oh, people are so zoned in. I'm like, do I need to log in? Do I need to pay for this? It's like, no, we, it's freely accessible to everyone. Okay, so we have to wrap up. Um, yes. Second to last slide. Great. Um, so we do like want to end on this note and very quick. <laughs> um, Part of what Sabrina and I did throughout this whole process was like every time we met to talk about the presentation itself, we asked some hard questions. Um, and one of them was, did we achieve what we set out to achieve? And luckily we have all this list and all those kinds of background things. But we only get to ask that question because we went through that iterative process of what's the what, what's the why, what's the how, what's the everything else, um, what's the who. And so asking those questions throughout the process is massively important. Um, but we also hope that you feel more confident in advocating for the sex projects because as you can see, it needs to be collaborative. There's no way in hell you're pulling this off on your own. Mm -hmm. um, but also that you feel like the big thing for me is learning how much work this takes. In my brain, it's a website. <laughs> it's, a builder, it's like a WordPress, it should be fine. Uh, no, it takes a lot of work. One of the digitization, scanning, getting things into certain qualities takes a lot of time. Um, and knowing that time, like if you think this started three years ago, essentially, it's getting ready to launch officially in 2026. <laughs> think about time. Um, <laughs> The other part that we really hammered in on was the, the different lines that happen between staff, stakeholders, and end users. What do you want those lines to be? How do you want those lines? What do you want lines in certain locations? You don't want certain people to be connected. Thinking about those connections and how they work together is pretty important. And the last thing is uh, why talking about and sharing these things matter. Um, I, we were joking, but like, if you really think about this, you are now in a room full of people who are interested in this topic. And this work is collaborative by nature, and you all have questions about this topic itself look to each other to learn about these things and ask these types of questions, because that's the only way this happens in the first place. Let alone when you get to this point in time where you're beta, 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 and you need to <laughs> test in a conference maybe, and try it out. Um, it's massively important. It's only when you do things like this, it's an active um, reflection in of itself of getting this information out there matters. Because uh, there were things that came up today that we hadn't thought about or that were actually iterative or were part of this process that are massively important. And that we got to share that in real time with y'all through this process too. Um, but throughout that whole kind of thing is just, you'll probably notice that we do really say the word diversity throughout this whole thing. That's pretty intentional. You don't even get to get to diversity until you do any of this background work. But only when you do things like this too that are in the background can you get to resurfacing or surfacing those narratives. Diversity is specificity, and you need that metadata to pull that out and resurface that information. And you need the collections. And you need the collections. We have three institutions right now. That's it. Yeah. I mean, we're large institutions, but you don't, there's not going to, I keep telling everyone, they want us to find these stories. They want us to, to uh, un, un, um, recover these key voices, but sometimes they're not there. We need more information. We need more material from different places. Uh, since Sabrina and I have cards, and normally the last slide has that information on there, but we did Q&A kind of, and it's 3 o'clock, and we need to wrap up so the next presenters get to go. Uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs>